Welcome to the GBC Big 3 podcast, a weekly podcast where we sit down and unpack three big questions raised from our Sunday sermon. Or at least that's what we would normally be doing. On Sunday, we heard from Mark Rader, who spoke about perseverance as part of our series in the book of Hebrews titled Anchor. And you can listen to that message again through our regular GBC sermons podcast. But today we're doing something a little bit different. Every now and then on Slido, a question comes up that is just too big for the big three. The theological and doctrinal implications of the question need a little bit more time than the 10 minutes that we give each question in each podcast. And so we put it aside. We don't want that question to go unanswered, but every now and then we bring those questions out and we give an entire podcast to it. And we call this the fourth question. And so today, we wanted to take an opportunity to tackle one of those questions. And the question that has come up a number of times over the weeks and months has been the question around women in ministry, or more specifically, women in leadership. And so today, to help me unpack this really big, robust topic, I've got Mark Rader and Roxanne Lawler. Guys, thank you so much for being here today. Pleasure. Now, obviously, this is a debate that has, um, you know, been going on for a long time and different churches, different denominations have different stances. Um, As we seek to unpack and discuss this topic, can I ask each of you, what's something that you want our listeners and our viewers to remember as we kind of start this discussion? Raider, I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, while I I probably wouldn't... um, classify this as a salvation issue mm. I'd also think that I think it's a very important issue yeah uh, and uh, it's one that I think people need to grapple with mm. um, I think men need to grapple with it differently than women need to grapple with it yeah um, but I think it's it's a significant one mm. and so I think that um, I, I wouldn't want people to walk away from having watched or listened to this saying to themselves oh that was really that's simple or it's not that big a deal like it's a big deal (laughs) and it's and it's worth taking the time to work through yeah great awesome Rox how about you yeah I'd probably um add some emotional weight to that that it's actually quite emotional for a lot of women and Mm. um uh, strikes to the heart of their identity and who they are yeah um if they believe that God's called them into leadership to suddenly come across this you know giant wall in their way um another thing is this is not going to be the be all end all of discussions on this (laughs) this is a really big topic yeah uh, so we're just going to sort of skate around the surface of it, mm. you know, you know, open some windows, have a look inside. Uh, yep. But you're not going to get your all your answers out of this. Yeah, but you'll absolutely. get some. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess I should caveat by saying that, you know, here at GBC, we are an egalitarian church. And so obviously our answers and our discussion will probably be from that perspective and to that bias. Um, we do support women in leadership. Rox, I know you're in the process of going through accreditation, okay. um, which is super exciting. So I guess I should caveat that for our audience as well. Yeah. Um, but guys, let's get into the fourth question, the ominous fourth question. Um, So I guess I think the first place that I wanted to start for us is, you know, scripture, because that seems like the appropriate place to start. Um, Can you guys help unpack for for me and our our listeners, our audience, around the biblical um, texts that are used, I guess, both to support women in leadership, but then on the flip side, women not being in leadership. Um, Rader, can I start with you on this one? You may. Um, <laughs> you may. Took a very yeah. big, deep breath. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the biblical, the biblical um, perspective, I think, contains the basis for both positions, mm. right? Um, and it kind of depends a little bit on where you start, right? Yeah. So... Um, there would be those who would hold a complementary, uh, complementarian position, yep. uh, who would go back to the created order, all right? Mm. In part because uh, Paul refer- refers to that in in that passage in one Timothy, um, and that would be their theological basis, yep. through which then they read all the information that we have about you know m- m- uh, women in leadership positions or um, their role within the church moving forward. Um, I think an egalitarian position might work from a very different perspective. So, Mm. for instance, I think that Paul's 
um, description that in Christ there is neither male nor female. Yeah. That language seems mm. to me to be a, a position where I would then read through some of the other um, circumstances, yep. uh, some of the other passages. So, you know, when you're talking about women in leadership, you, you know, you, you, you end up talking, I think, because of the way that the discussion has, uh, the, the, the path the discussion's taken in, in um, churches, you end up having to talk about Genesis and the created order. Yep. You have to end up talking about the um, original intent that God may have had mm. uh, for men and women in their relationships with one another. You have to deal with the impact of the fall, particularly in terms of how you know, your desire will be for your husband and what that means. Um, you have to then work through um, the examples of women in leadership because there are examples of yeah, women in leadership, absolutely. both from a prophetic sense, but also leading the nation, um, you know, particularly like someone like Deborah mm. or Miriam, who had significant leadership roles in the New Testament. There's ample evidence in Paul's you know, list of greetings in Romans 16 and other mm. places in Acts and the inclusion of women in Jesus's ministry that like women had a, had a different role in that context. You need to unpick some of the cultural context, which is always part of interpretation, and then deal with, you know, the second, the sorry, the 1 Timothy 2 passage yep. uh, in, in some sort of context. So uh, like... I feel like you've just given me a thousand more questions. Though. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's education for yeah. you, right? Uh, and, and so I reckon though that that's a really important thing for people to recognize. Mm. That you know, it has to be a fairly comprehensive thing. You can't just deal with you know one Timothy two, mm. right? Because there'd be some who would you know interpret it quite differently than I. Yeah. So for me, I would I would see um, one Timothy two as being relatively culturally impacted. I think there's something quite significant about the wider cultural mm. context, and I would see that it is um, not the primary old sorry New Testament text, but that. Paul's statement about no male, male nor female, the examples that we have, that's the norm. Mm. Uh, and that we need to figure out what Timothy does, uh, what, what Paul's saying to Timothy yep. in its, its wider context. That, that's how I would go with it. Someone in a complementarian position would, have to, would, would interpret it very differently, but they then have to figure out what to do with the examples of women in leadership. Yeah. Apart from saying, I think, because I think this is a cop-out, to say that, well, you know, there weren't any godly men there, and therefore, you know a woman had to step in, but that's not God's plan. Like, th that doesn't seem to be an adequate response. Mm. So, you, I, I guess, <laughs> part of what I'm saying is, <laughs> there are problems with either side. Yeah. Right? In the sense that you, you're going to have to grapple with uh, questions of interpretation, mm. kind of all the way through. Yeah. So. Rox, what do you have to, to add to this? Because, I mean, I'm assuming, but I'm assuming that you've spent some time grappling with this as a woman moving into leadership or already in leadership. Yeah. What have been your reflections in this? Yeah, it's, um, I think for a lot of women who are called into leadership, it is a bit of a journey that you do go on. Mm. Um, and um, the journey isn't just on the issue of women in leadership. It's actually on, um, a, a, it's actually wider and broader. It's actually about how we read the Bible. Yeah. Um, because when we when we look at that issue and um, we can't just pluck it out of the pages and, and treat it in isolation, it's actually about the lens through which we read all of scripture, yeah. which is kind of what I was getting to when you talk about that emotional connection, because mm. it actually makes you think, well, how am I reading all of it? Um, how am I reading all of scripture when I, you know, do I pluck out that part about greet one another with a holy kiss? You know, how, how seriously do I take that? Yeah. What about Particularly this during COVID times, yes, am I right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hello. Um, what about the whole, you know, like um, being modest and not having braided hair and, you know, mm. where do we... Where do we draw the line? How much is cultural? How much is not? How much is, um, how much was just Paul's directions to Timothy in, as you mm. said, a particular scenario, a, t a particular environment that was just speaking to that? We obviously contextualise a lot of scripture yeah. um, in in the broader picture. What is for then? What is for now? Mm. And so that that wrestle has to be gone through. Yeah. Um, and it it can be actually uh, traumatic mm. for a lot of women. Um, it can be. Um, it can be damaging to your mm. faith, but also it can strengthen your faith. Mm. Um, and I would encourage um, women who are unsure about this to just really do some work. There's a lot of great resources out there. Um, there's a lot of things to read. And, and just to, to bring it before the Lord and, and ask God, mm. you know, what, is, what are you saying here, God? What about me? You know, I've got this call on my heart, got this call on my life for leadership. I've got this pounding you know, in my spirit mm. that you're asking me to do something, but I keep coming up against these walls, these yep. um, barriers, you know, like how God, 
God, are you going to give me this passion in my heart to serve you, this desire to see your kingdom come? Mm. But, you know, this is in front of me. So I just want to encourage um, women to just really do some serious reading on that and mm. serious research and serious prayer yeah. on that because I do believe that God does want to raise up women um, for their unique ability to lead and it's different to men. Yep. Um, I just, yeah, I honestly believe that he does want to raise up the next generation and um, and I would hate to think that our interpretation and understanding of the Bible is going to stop God from doing what God wants to and needs yep. to do. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, like I would say broadly, that's <laughs> kind of what I was trying to get at as yeah. well. Like, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. No, like in the sense that I think you know how you read the Bible, yeah. like that that it, to some degree that's the fundamental issue. Yeah. You know, in terms of how you address some of those questions, and I, I would agree that you know, I, I, like you know, as you say, state uh, Matt, you know, we're an egalitarian position. That's been my position for quite a long time. Mm. Uh, I think it's a really important position to hold, and and I think that there are again some theological reasons for that. You know, yeah. I think that the idea that you know, men and women are equally created in the image of God mm. is really important. Mm. There's no place in Scripture that really describes men as being differently sinful than women. Yep. You know, like our hearts are equally mm. uh, prone to drift from mm. the Lord. Um, there's no sense that salvation is different. There's yep. no sense that there's a different giving of the Holy Spirit. Mm. That none of the gift lists, none of the gift lists in the New Testament are gendered. Yeah. You know, so there's never any kind of sense of okay, here's the men's gifts and here's the women's yep. gifts, and you know, th that's the way that this mm. th the whole thing works. Um, yeah. So, I, like, I think that there's, I think that's an important affirmation mm. uh, to say that I think that, you know, because women have been equally saved and equally given the Holy Spirit, then they are equally invited into mm. the We are new creations as well, yeah. so mm. there's that sense so. that... Yeah. Alright, so, uh, like, a number of things have kind of been raised for me yeah. um, as you guys have spoken. I'd love to I'd love to spend a little bit more time kind of unpacking, um, you know, some of those key... Um, parts of scripture that uh, are used in this debate because I think um, for, you know, I know for myself and I know for a lot of um, a lot of Christians, a lot of young Christians, they're being um, presented with this question and presented with certain scriptures to, you know, to back yeah. either for or against. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it would be helpful to equip them with a bit of an exegesis of those yep. passages. But also, Rox, when you were talking about the contextualization of Scripture mm. and how some Scripture is contextualized and some isn't, mm -hmm. because I think that then raises attention as well around, well, are we contextualizing something that shouldn't be contextualized? And I guess that's the question yep. for a lot of people. And how do we discern that? And, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. is this just human interpretation of a divine text and, yeah. and how that system is flawed? Like, as you yep. can see, questions just coming out of this brain yeah. um let's let's go back to to scripture because i do think that that's a good place to start um if i can obviously um the the most known passage in regards to the women in leadership um discussion is found in one timothy um Raider, I know you've, um, you, you know, you released a paper for us as a church around um, mm -hmm. your interpretation of that scripture. I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you can kind of um, remember what I wrote. Remember what you wrote. <laughs> um, that's okay, because I remember it. Um, so, <laughs> but uh, I feel like it should come from you. Uh, but you know, if you can kind of share that, um, I think that would be really helpful, Rox. I'd love to yeah. hear your your reflections on that yeah. as well. Yeah, sure. Um, I think again, there's a couple of questions kind of prior yeah, to absolutely. to that. So one of one of them is, I think that um, I would see that the normative practice in Scripture, in mm. Acts, and in Jesus's ministry, and you know, for examples in Romans and whatnot, um, that women were involved in positions of leadership. Yeah. So when you come then to what Paul has to say in uh, 1 Timothy 2, I see that as as being the exception to the rule, mm -hmm. right? And so that there's a there's there's some sort of reason and rationale for that, yep. right? And, and again, as I said before, if you see that as Paul's norm in, mm. in 1 Timothy 2, then mm. you have to treat and answer why the rest of those exceptions seem to exist. Yep. You know, Phoebe is a deaconess and, you know, um, Paul's engagement with other women, like mm. all that kind of stuff. So, I, like, I'm, I'm, that's an important first step. And I think, secondly, the passage itself is not nearly as straightforward as people sometimes suggest mm. it is, right? So everything from, you know, the Greek word, about I you know do not permit a woman to have authority. The term yeah. have authority yeah. is what's called a hapex legoma. Sure. Uh, legomena, the, where it's basically <laughs> it's the only occurrence of that Greek word in the New Testament. 
So yeah. we, we don't really have, I mean, there are others in, in uh, external Greek literature, mm. but we don't have other contexts. It's not as if that's a regular word that Paul uses mm. when he talks about authority. Uh, and so we just have to be aware that Paul's using a unique term in a relatively unique passage. Yeah. I mean, this is the same passage that says that women will be saved by childbearing. Mm. Now, pretty sure that's an exception yeah. to the rule. Right? Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure it's faith for women too, mm. right? And so we, we need to kind of make some sense of that. But I do, I do believe that the indication about um, childbearing actually perhaps gives us some of the contextual... Um, leverage to make some sense of it. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's Ben Witherington the Third, an sure. academic name. If you've ever heard Again, one, I don't believe it. <laughs> I think I can't remember the name of the book. Um, but it, but he talks about like women in Greco-Roman cultures, mm. uh, and and I believe that his his primary argument is that for Paul, um, Paul wants to make sure that the gospel is not brought into disrepute by the actions and activities of Christians. Yeah. Right. So if people are going to reject the gospel, they have to reject Jesus. Yeah. Right. If you're going to be offended, be offended by the cross. Mm. Don't be offended by our behavior. And so Paul's, you know, his premise about I become all things to all people mm. so that I might win some. Mm. Right. And so the the language then of Paul, which I think links in with some of the household codes about submission and whatnot yep. elsewhere, that Paul is not so much stating that this submission has to be the eternal way. Mm. per se, but that by casting aside the social constraints, um, that they would bring the gospel into disrepute. Yeah. And so there's, there's some evidence, and this is disputed because we don't really have any, any kind of real clarity around it, but there's some evidence that Timothy was dealing with um, some, uh, some issues around women who were not in a relationship. Right? So there's a bunch of information about widows and how you deal with widows and when they should be brought into the lists and all of those sorts of things yep. elsewhere in Timothy. And you can imagine a scenario where you had, and he talks about you know, gossips and busybodies and whatnot, where you could have people who were ultimately bringing the gospel into disrepute yep. by their, their actions. Yep. And, I, and I think that's a fairly helpful way forward. Mm. Um, I think it makes some sense of the household codes as well to mm. be able to say, you know what, the issue for Paul was not just that women submit to their husbands. Mm. The issue was that the gospel is not um, hindered because people would look at the family unit kind of go, geez, like what's with, what's with your wife? You know, why is she acting that way? Like mm. why, is she, like what's, like I don't have, I don't, I don't want anything to do with this Christian mm. thing if that's mm. how my wife's going to end up acting mm. or if that's how my family's going to react or whatever it might be. So I, I think that that's a fairly helpful way forward. And I, th and I think as a principle then makes this issue really important. Yeah. Because I believe that the gospel is being brought into disrepute by saying that women are somehow not able to speak, mm. teach, have authority over, lead. I, I just yeah. don't get it. Because mm. everywhere else in our society, women hold you know, positions and... Um, of leadership yep. uh, and of influence, mm -hmm. um, and you know, while while there's not gender equality, how I think we would like to see gender yep. equality, you know, women can do anything that men can do, and mm. you know, the, the positions of influence and and all of that is is very prevalent and prominent, mm. uh, and so to have this one little corner and pocket where it just kind of goes, eh, no, we don't see that. You know, that says that women are equal, but they can't do the same things, I think is mm. dissonant. So on that, because you've raised something that I kind of had in the back of my mind, which is this whole um, how Scripture talks about, um, I guess, gender roles, particularly in the household, mm. and how that can sometimes be used um, in, in this discussion of women in leadership. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you're kind of saying that... Um, that Scripture that referred to, uh, like, wives submitting to their husbands, was that... Um, was that in regards to so that so that the gospel wasn't brought into disrepute? Um, it was kind of conforming to a social expectation of um, well, uh, patriarchy. Like if like if I'm using the term incorrectly, please correct me. But um, yeah, yeah, I, w I would say that there, yeah, like that Paul was considering their mm. their context and what would be what would have been considered either shameful or mm. inappropriate or yep. offensive. Mm. Um, and, and utilizing that, yep. and again, I think uh, I think that that's Ben Witherington's yes. kind of position on that, mm. and I found that quite helpful, um, yeah, because you know that you know ultimately Paul 
also subverts the household by mm. saying that husbands should love their wives and you should submit to one another. Like, yeah. So, like, he doesn't just say, he doesn't just reinforce the, the patriarchy yeah. in that sense. Uh, now, that, those, are, those are equally complicated passages for us. Yeah. Um, but I, I, you know, I... Uh, yeah, you can probably guess how I <laughs> <laughs> interpret that. Yeah. So, Rocks. Yeah, yeah that, the passage that you're referring to, I think, is the one in Ephesians. That, um, Ephesians five. Is it, is it? Ephesians five. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, talks about submit to one another out of love. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing I always find interesting um, is that we're actually asked to submit to one another out of love, mm. um, out of reverence for Christ. And then when it actually says wives to your husbands, it doesn't actually say in the Greek, wives submit to your husbands. It's it's a carry-on. It's wives to your husbands yeah. as to the Lord. So you can't actually make sense of um, the instruction to wives to submit to their husband unless you've read the first part, which is the one another. Yeah. Uh, we know the Bible's full of those one another's, mm. you know, that we're supposed to be doing this for one another. Mm. So wives submit to your husbands. I think the, the first audience would have read that and gone, well, duh, of course. I mean, you know, the grass is green, the sky is blue, wives submit to your husbands. <laughs> That's just the way it is. Yeah. Um, the interesting thing in, in a Greco-Roman culture would be that whole men um, love your wives as you love yourself. That's the... That's the red flashing light for them That's back the then. That's the That's the, oh my gosh, what? You've just, it's com- because, you know, wives were a possession, right? Mm. Um, and, um, and they weren't, you know, it wasn't an equal relationship that we might have, mm. you know, in, in our marriages today. It was almost a, you know, arranged marriage. It's a possession. You have, you know, you've got your domain, I've got my domain. Yeah. And so for, for men to be told to love their wives, that was countercultural. That was extraordinary. Mm. You may as well go tell them to live in the garage with his car. You know, like, uh, that's the astounding part that Paul yeah. uh, gives this instruction uh, mm. and, and just elevates the whole uh, family relationship to be that, that unified, that one another, love one another because mm. of Christ. You do this, yeah, you're doing that already, but you do this, we're, yeah. we're equal. So I think sometimes when we read those texts, we don't actually pay enough attention to what the, the man is asked to do in this because yeah. that does also inform. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Super helpful. I want to I want to um, digress a little bit back to um, as I was saying before. Well, you were saying before, Rox, about how we contextualize certain texts because yeah. they're you know they're spoken to a certain time, a certain audience, a certain community, um, and a certain experience, and, and we understand that. And so you know you can wear braids, or you know mm-hmm. women don't have to wear don't have to cover their heads in church anymore. Yeah. And, you know, um, I think there's something about tattoos. I've got tattoos, so I hope I'm not breaking, you know, biblical law. Just Leviticus 19. That's yep, okay. So sorry. <laughs> so sorry, Leviticus. Um, but, you know, so we have those passages. Um, I guess something that, you know, I've definitely heard in, in discussions around um, women in leadership is that, you know, uh, that we're, in, we're, we're placing contextualization on something that shouldn't be contextualized um, and that, you know, again, um, if, if you can just interpret Scripture the way you want to interpret Scripture in this context, then what does that mean for other contexts mm-hmm. where, there, where there's other Scripture, um, you know, speaking to other situations that, um, that shouldn't be contextualized? You see how it kind of, it, it just kind of, snowballs um so can we can we talk a little bit into uh, i guess for you guys and your understandings how um how i guess we we can come to to this um this topic this discussion these these um points of scripture and interpret them in a way that you know contextualizes is that a clear enough question? I feel like maybe, yes, no. Raider's face is just like, seriously, <laughs> Willis? Like, come on, mate. <laughs> we can provide some answers and yeah. if they answer the question, good. Yeah, sure, yeah. great. Yeah. <laughs> well, we always start with Raider, so yeah? I'm happy okay. for you to kick that off. I don't want to muck around with the big... I'm never on the big three, so the big three pattern, I'm just waiting my turn. But gotcha, um, <laughs> gotcha. All right. Well, Are you okay yeah, under yeah. the bus there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. Um... Yeah, I, I mean, I think that um, there can be an assumption sometimes that there is only one way to interpret Scripture, mm. right? Yeah. There's only one way to do it. And uh, I think that that's, um, I don't think that's right. Mm. There, there are some interpretations that are, I think, um, more clearly aligned to, yeah. the, to the passage, right? Like, so, you know, I remember doing some reading in the parables of Jesus, and uh, there was a, a relatively infamous uh, interpretation of the 
uh, what was it? It was the prodigal son, uh, where it was Freudian. So the son oh, wow. <laughs> who stayed and the son who left and the father all represented the id, the super ego and ego and whatnot. Yeah. And it was often held up in many of the articles as basically going, yeah, I don't think that's right. <laughs> and so I do think that kind of falls outside of the boundaries of how I would look to interpret that text, yeah. right? But I think broadly speaking, there's lots of different interpretive uh, principles. Mm -hmm. And I think scripture goes beyond our interpretation. Mm. Uh, and, you know, um, and we always bring our own history, our own perspective, yeah. um, our own insights to a, a text. We bring our culture mm -hmm. to it, mm -hmm. um, which means that sometimes we miss some of the things that would have been standouts yeah. in the, in, in, for the original audience that mm -hmm. we don't. And, and you know, some of our uh, principles of, of hermeneutics try to correct that, right? So let's pay attention to the original context mm -hmm. and let's try to figure out what it was that Paul was saying or that Timothy was reading or whatever it might be. And I think that that's really valuable. But I think it's also worth pointing out that from the very beginning, the, the Word of God needed to be interpreted. Mm. We even find examples of the interpretation of the Word of God in the Word of God. Yep. <laughs> right? So, you know, Moses has to explain the law to the people. Mm. And it wasn't just a matter of, you know, working out, um, you just kind of restating it. Mm. It was about uh, applying it to specific circumstances. Yep. You see the same thing in, uh, say, the book of um, Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, when they uh, they decide on how they're going to deal with intermarriage, yeah, uh, there's kind of a decision mm. that's not really um, found in the law, right? The law says don't intermarry. They had, and their solution, their application of it was this kind of wholesale divorce, yeah. which elsewhere you kind of go, I'm not sure that's the best way forward, but that was their application of mm. it. You find Jesus reinterpreting the law. So yeah. there's this ongoing um, reinterpretation. And then, of course, you know, the whole Old Testament gets kind of a redo when the Christians get a hold of it yep. because they're looking at it through the lens of Jesus yep. as its fulfillment. And so, you know, mm. I think that for us to assume that there is only one way mm. um, is, is, is not helpful. And to assume that somehow... Our context is only ever unhelpful for clarity. I think mm. is not quite right. We believe that God's word is con is a text. Uh, sorry, contextually located. Right? Yeah. So it's historically located, mm. but that it's eternally relevant, which means that we can apply it to our circumstances yeah. and we bring our situations to it and we bring for instance the equality that we see of women in our water culture mm. and we bring that to scripture yeah and i don't think that's that's necessarily a wrong thing mm. scripture stands mm. eternally mm. and we can we can interpret our lives mm. through it yeah you know and we you know we have to be careful we don't want to make scripture our servant mm. to justify our positions um, yep. And that, that's, I guess, the risk of it. Mm. Again, I think it's Walter Brueggemann who says that there's a risk in interpretation. Mm. I think that there is. Uh, and we need to be able to embrace that and kind of go, okay, I may need, I may need to be corrected. I may need mm. to um, rethink my position. But, you know, I don't want to shy away from my context. Yep. You know, I'm a father of three girls. I don't, know, I don't want them growing up believing that there's stuff they can't do. Yeah that somehow they're not adequate or fit for mm. leadership. Mm. And God's given them wonderful leadership abilities. Mm. You know? mm -hmm. um, I remember reading a, an article. It was, it was actually about using gender-inclusive language. And it was a scholar who basically, his, his, his view changed quite radically when his daughter came in and asked him, she was quite young, as I recall, and said, why is the Bible only for boys? Because every time it used he, 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 yeah. he, you know, it, when sometimes it, it can be they, mm. you know. Um, and he just said, that really changed things for me. And I'm like, yeah, absolutely it should. Mm. In our context, we don't read he or mankind the same way they did 30 mm. years ago. Yeah. Anyway, so I digress. <laughs> no, I think <laughs> that's, that's really good. And, and what that raises for me, actually, um, is that obviously as you said, like we do need to bring scripture into our, mm. into our context and our culture and our, and, and our world. Um, I think what's raised for me is that, you know, and we've talked about this a number of times that we should never do this alone. 
Um, that you know, there's, this is just another reason to reinforce the call to be yeah. in community, to be um, the church, mm-hmm. to be doing this together, to be looking to our leaders and our teachers um, mm-hmm. in our setting, both men and women, and to be um, having these discussions, to, yeah. to be opening up, putting it out on the table, having those hard, raw, difficult moments, mm-hmm. but doing it together. Because obviously, you know, there is there is a, a time and a place um, or, or circumstances, I should say, where, you know, our, our context can inform our reading of Scripture. And then there are times where mm-hmm. our context doesn't change what Scripture says. Yeah. Um, we should never try and discern that alone. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, we should always be doing that in discussion with one another and mm. in, in community with one another mm. um, to make sure that, you know, again the gospel is not brought into disrepute. Yeah, Yeah, that's good, Matt. Um, As you're talking about this, I'm kind of remembering um, we've looked at Scripture in this way before and um, I just think about the American Civil War and the discussion around slavery. Mm. And um, there's a book, I've not actually read it, I admit. But it's it's on my bookshelf. (laughs) It's It's the American Civil War as a theological crisis Mm. Um, because both sides profess to be Christian and to be, um, you know, given their God-given right and one was was very anti-slavery and one was very pro-slavery, which is obviously the South and this is in the UK as well. Mm. Uh, and the South was saying, you know, no, you know what? It says here in the Bible exactly how to treat our slaves. And it says, slaves, submit to your masters. Mm. Bam, here it is in black and white. And um, <laughs> the abolitionists, uh, you know, are kind of doing the whole, um, I'm going back to the castle here, but um, the, it's the vibe, it's Marbo. And they, yeah. they were sort of saying, you know, this is the, you know, God, you know, sure it does say, you know, the instructions for slaves and for, for masters and mm. household codes, but but God actually doesn't want people to be bound in slavery. God's ultimate plan is, is freedom for them to be fully who they're meant to be mm. and for them to live lives, you know, of freedom, you know, not just in Christ, obviously, but but also socially. Yeah. Um, and so, but their argument was so much harder mm. <laughs> because they were kind of just um, summarizing the vibe, the, yeah. the path that scripture had taken, this trajectory yeah. that, that scripture was on. And that kind of, every time we, we talk about these women in leadership and ministry issue, I kind of circle back into that because mm. there isn't in, in, in black and white um, disputed texts about you know instructions um and frequently the egalitarian position seems to be more a there's a trajectory there's a there's a pathway god is is moving us from um out of our sin into his perfect will for us uh, Mm. his perfect plan for society and for life and and that seems to happen in stages you know yeah as um as we move towards what god wants then he he brings us further and further along yeah um and uh, yeah, so for me, the, the, the concept of slavery uh, mm. is, is almost similar to this argument that we're having yeah. about women in leadership. Awesome. Well, I, I, and we, I guess we said this from the very beginning, <laughs> we, we're yeah. not answering it. I guess this is no. part of the discussion that I think we need to invite yeah. all believers into, um, mm. whether complementarian or egalitarian. Um, but, you know, we need to be having this conversation um, and... And I guess going into the sometimes discomfort of it, sometimes, like you said, um, rocks the hurt of it, and actually, mm. um, actually opening ourselves up to what, yeah, what I think, the Holy um, Spirit is guiding us in. In that I think space, we're starting from that place of humility, mm. um, either in our conversations with one another, but also mm. in the way we approach the Bible. We bring our culture, but I think we need to do that in a way that is humble and open to the Lord. Yeah, it's like, okay, God, you know, I'm just, you know, there's no way that my finite mind can understand the mm. precious word, you know, mm. help me here. And, and approach everything from that position of humility and yep. openness to God. And that's going to do us a lot of favours, to be honest. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, what a great place to not end the conversation, yeah. but let's just say pause for now. Um, thank you guys so much for, for joining us today. Thanks, Matt. Awesome. Well, as we've said a number of times, this discussion has only started to scratch the surface of this topic of women in leadership. But if you're wanting to dig a little bit deeper, we've made some resources available. We've listed them on the notes section in the podcast. So feel free um, to find those books, um, to find those authors and dig a little bit deeper um, in this topic.
If you want to be a part of the conversation, make sure that you log into our online services this Sunday at gbconline.org.au and that you snap the Slido QR code before the sermon to get involved. Just a reminder for those of you who are listening to the Big Three podcast, it now is filmed each week and goes to air on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. at GBC Online. If you've enjoyed the Big Three today, be sure to give us a star rating and subscribe so that you can stay up to date with all future episodes. Well, thanks for joining us for this week's Big Three and our deep dive into God's invitation for us all. Remember, there's no thought too small, no question too big.